Uh, again, thank you all for joining today as we begin our incubating leadership conversation for September. Uh, just a quick plug, uh, we do this roughly monthly. Um, and at the end of this month, we had to reschedule our last month's uh, conversation with Sandra, Lo Sandra Long, and she will be uh, presenting September 30th uh, here at the same uh, leadership forum. And I will be placing the registration link in the chat here for anyone who has not been able to register yet. Uh, so feel free to check this, check her out uh, September 30th as she talks about LinkedIn for le leaders, igniting your brand, sales, and hiring. Uh, but for today, I'm happy to introduce uh, our speaker, Michelle, Michelle Clark Sears, uh, who is a career coach, motivation, motivational speaker, and co-founder of World Sears, Inc., uh, which is an international consulting uh, agency focused on career coaching, soft skills, uh, skill, soft skill training, and business development. Uh, she's also the host of her own podcast, the Global Advocate Career Podcast, uh, which can be found on Apple Music, Spotify, and a plethora of other places. Uh, I will also post a link uh, to that and very shortly while she's talking, so feel free to check her out if you enjoy podcasts. Uh, but Michelle is, is an awesome Renaissance woman, uh, fluent, very interesting, fluent in multiple languages, uh, holds interest in performing arts, comedy, producing, writing, you name it. And she even has a black belt, uh, first degree black belt in Taekwondo. So phenomenal woman, happy to introduce her. And I'm very grateful that she's here today to share uh, her piece. So thank you, Michelle, for being here. Matthew, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I wanted to thank uh, Mandy Williams, who uh, put forth my name to be considered as a speaker. So thank you very much, Mandy. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Leadership Forum for inviting me and having me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let's just get started. This is my uh, cover sheet and it's incubating leadership at any stage in your career. And I wanted to emphasize on the age, right? Because it doesn't matter what age you're in, you can still incubate leadership. So I wanted to explore that and some other aspects. Here's a little information about me. Um, I've worked on the city, state, and federal level. I've worked in international affairs. Uh, as my dear colleague Matthew mentioned, uh, yes, I do have a first degree in a, in a, um, a black belt in Taekwondo, so I can protect anyone here. It would be my pleasure. This is what I did back in the days. These are some photos, right? Me with various presidents, when I was in stand up, when I was with uh, the British monarchy. So that was me then. All right, a few years ago, and this is me now. Uh, panelist, a presenter, keynote speaker, uh, podcast host. And what does World Series do? Well, I do executive coaching, also transitional coaching, right? Where I deal with individuals experience job loss. And I also work with entrepreneurs and business owners in the US and particularly in Brazil. So what does incubating leadership mean? Um, you know, I, I've, I've attended your events, some of your events, and uh, it made me think like, what is it that incubating leadership mean for me? And I'm just getting my notes here. Um, hold me for two seconds. It's to encourage and adapt continuous professional growth for yourself while empowering others. This is my interpretation of what incubating leadership means. And I believe you have to first start with communicating effectively with yourself, then with others by utilizing different methods of communication. So let's go further into that. I, like I said, you need to communicate effectively with yourself a lot. Why? Well, if you don't start with yourself, it's not sustainable. I, I mean, we check in with our loved ones, we checked in with our friends, but I also believe that checking in and making sure you're okay with you is essential. Why? Because it ensures that we're putting value on ourselves and our happiness to the best of our ability. How can we value others if we don't value ourselves? 
Now, as a career coach, there are critical questions that one should ask themselves, right, with the guidance of a career coach. And I remember, I, excuse me, I remind clients that they are in the driver's seat. Well, what do I mean by that? That means that they make a determination on what they want out of life, particularly in their careers. And one way is to um, have them ask clarifying questions such as these. So what happens if you don't push forward and seek fulfillment in your profession? Consider these statistics. 85% of individuals are unhappy in their jobs. And that's according to a 2017 Gallup poll. A startling 85% globally are not happy. What about locally, Michelle? 53% in the United States equates to 53% of the workforce, which actually included me a few years ago. So once you decide to move forward, you'll have to recognize that you are going to have to start embracing risks. So here's my first poll question. Now, um, Matthew, if you could help me out here. Thank you so much because I, I can only do one thing. Have you taken a risk lately? I'm gonna answer for myself. And when you have the results up, let me know. Fantastic, fantastic. So let me just close that here. For those, for the 80% that have taken risks, phenomenal. And for the other 20, let me explain why I asked the question about risk taking. Because people who enjoy taking risks were more content with their lives, right? A 2015 survey right out of Bonn, Germany explains this. And the reason why this survey is significant is because it demonstrates positive brain chemicals responding under several promoting growth factors that contribute to the development of robust neural networks that form the basis of our physical and mental skills. I'll take this a step further and reinforce that brain is wired. The brain is wired to help us. And that is called for us coaches, neuroplasticity. You may have heard about neuroplasticity for the sake of um, our, um, my presentation. I'll just explain a quick second. As a coach, I love the word because it demonstrates that your brain is set up to help you learn with repetition on an on, with ongoing reinforcement, right? That's why we encourage repetitive behaviors such as positive affirmations, right? Doing and working towards one's goals. Working one, towards one's goal, excuse me. Uh, Jack Canfield, uh, I highly recommend if, if, if you haven't heard of him, following him. He has written many books and he's a phenomenal motivational speaker. This is what he said about taking risks and I wholeheartedly agree. So once you're determined that you can you take risks, there's a few things that I advise to be aware of. The imposter syndrome. Uh, for those who may be familiar with the terminology, basically it's thinking that because you succeeded in the past, you can't succeed again. And it's real. So being aware that that may come up, also forgiving yourself. Let's say you took a risk in the past and it wasn't successful, or maybe you made a step and you didn't like the results. Forgive yourself and move on. Also, unfriending and deactivating the naysayers. This is important. I call them Debbie Downers, where individuals where they may be around you may not be fully supportive of you. And when you're taking risks and seeking to move forward, I would say you'd probably have to give those folks the boot. Also visualizing the best for yourself repeatedly. Once you determine that you want, uh, that you've taken those steps successfully, now you can reinvent yourself. Hire a career coach, move forward in your career or start a new career, learn a new skill. But the point is, is to pursue your dream, not someone else's. These individuals, made a really big impression on me in my research. And these are the risk takers that I'd like to highlight, right? You've heard of Malala, suffered a serious uh, uh, attempt on her life in Pakistan, survived and now is a Nobel laureate. Vera Rivard, actually a young lady out of New Hampshire, 
uh, 14 years old who just recently crossed the English Channel. And Dolores swam, excuse me, swam by herself. And Dolores Eldora Johnson, what did she do? She graduated with her degree at 87 years of age. So these individuals have taken risks. We're no different. Okay, so how do you empower others? By empowering yourself first, which means you lead by example. And also by communicating effectively with them. Let's look at some ways. First, understanding and practicing the four different types of communication, verbal, nonverbal, written, and visual communication. So here's my second poll question. Which communication method is most important for you? And are you answering your questions too? Are you giving your answers as well, Matthew? Unfortunately, I'm not able to. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Next time, next time, next time. All right, let's see what the results are. Which communication is best? 45% said verbal, equal 45% nonverbal, written got zero, and visual got 9%. All right, very interesting. I personally, for me, nonverbal communication is key, but look, I would like to focus on two. Thank you very much for your responses. Let's focus on visual communication, mask to mask communication. Visu visual communication is just that, communication that relies on your eyes, right? So whereas we primarily communicated with our voices and still do, now we do so even more with our gaze. So it's worth delving into it deeper on how we come across to others and how it shows. And it, it shows when you make a concerted effort. I echo the sentiments of the trust ambassador, Robert Whipple, who discussed the importance of emotional intelligence and body language. It cannot be overlooked, particularly when you're working with others. By the way, did you know that there were 19 different types of smiles? So in terms of mass to mass communication, these are the areas where we may not be aware of it, but come across to others. Wrinkles, lifting of the eyelids, movement of corners of eyebrows, twinkle in the eyes. That's me there in the corner. So watch these cues. When you're communicating, think about what else you can do since we, you know, speaking, we're covering our, our mouths with our masks. The other cues are going to help accentuate what we're saying positively or negatively. So using hand gestures and postures, body language, right? Avoiding crossing your arms and having hands on your hips. Perhaps maybe nodding more and indicating that you are listening intently and your tonality of your voice, right? Individuals tend to think that perhaps it's not being registered, but it is. Now let's talk a little bit about nonverbal communication, right? Virtual etiquette. These are the areas that I'd like to highlight because they're important when it comes to uh, putting one's best foot forward. Nonverbal communication speaks volumes. We are now communicating via Zoom, WebEx, Skype, and other via video conferencing platforms more than ever. Vi virtual etiquette is essential because just like we exhibit table manners, we have, um, we exhibit virtual etiquette which demonstrates to others that we are being considerate right and be and what is it what is virtual etiquette in a sentence behavior which helps keep your virtual meetings productive and professional so here are some ways on how you can do that so whether you run a meeting or whether you're part of one your virtual etiquette will speak for you before you even utter a word actually a little story here i had a meeting with someone a potential business partner and he held his zoom meeting in his bedroom behind him was an unmade bed and that left an impression a bit of a negative impression on me so all the little things count right 
Thirdly, knowing cross-generational communication. This is essential, right? Knowing effective cross-generational communication is also key, particularly within organizations experiencing change management. If you want to avoid being misunderstood or a misunderstanding, take a look at the differences in preferred styles by generation and use it to your advantage when leading others. Let's take a look. The traditionalist. This is the individual that was born earlier on in the century. They prefer face-to-face -face meetings, don't mind being introduced, uh, excuse me, instructed, and require minimal supervision. I put a suggestion there as to how you may want to address a traditionalist, right? Formally, right? So nowadays we communicate via text and email, but they prefer verbal communication. And when working with a traditionalist, my suggestion would be ask them for their expertise and their opinion. They may very well want to share it. Also, I recommend addressing them formally, as I've indicated, until they indicate otherwise. The baby boomer, right? We hear a lot about the baby boomer, born in the middle of the century, more or less, and are used to, here are their traits. They're generally used to being in jobs for a very long time and are considered lifers, right? They're competitive and have tended to put work over family. Baby boomers work hard and it's understandable considering that they were raised during several wars. Uh, how can you work with a baby boomer better? If you run a business or need someone who's dedicated and loyal, a baby boomer may be a good choice. Since they prefer to discuss professional over private life, perhaps you may want to recognize their accomplishments and work with them on their tech choices. Here's a suggestion that I have on what you may, how you may want to um, come across to or collaborate with a baby boomer. Generation X. This is the generation that have, are otherwise known as latchkey kids, right? These are individuals that have been, that are preferred to be direct and straightforward. Um, and they prefer to discuss their professional and personal lives. So here's a suggestion on how to communicate with someone who's Gen X. You know, you may wanna ask them how they're doing, compliment them on a recent accomplishment online, and then wanna connect. A millennial is someone who is, we all know about millennials, right? We hear a lot of um, individuals complain about millennials, but I've got a different tact on that. But let's look at w what makes up a millennium. Uh, someone who was born between 1980 and 19, excuse me. Ooh, that's a typo there. Sorry about that. But basically they were born in 1980 and they tend to not stay in a job too long because they're comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? So whereas perhaps a baby boomer may not like the instability, millennials are used to it. This, however, does not mean that they do not take the workplace seriously and therein is the misinterpretation, right? That because they don't necessarily stay in a role that they're not vested in it. Actually, that's not the case. So, um, but while understanding that dynamic, they do in view themselves as equal. And this may be another point of contention in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So with these general, so actually millennials are super tech savvy. So you may want to reach out to one. Um, they communicate pretty much exclusively online. So you may want to collaborate with them and mention uh, to to do the same that you prefer to be recipro uh, reciprocate and also uh, get information that they have made sent to via Slack or uh, email, et cetera. Interestingly enough, they prioritize family over work. So they like to have their time at work, but then afterwards for leisure. So with these generational differences in mind, with communication in mind, my recommendation is let's go into breakout sessions and discuss what's been covered during this presentation. And here are the questions. Matthew, we have 14 participants. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I will break us out into about three or four breakout rooms. Um, and they will consist of about three or four people. Uh, okay. Um, and we can all have a good chance to discuss and 
kind of share where we're at at the moment. Oh man, I, beautiful, I can, beautiful, it's gorgeous. I can see oh. your hearts there. I can see it. <laughs> Thank you. We're all, we are all back, Michelle. Uh, Matthew, by the way, yes. hip and cool. <laughs> yes, hip and cool is the word that we <laughs> our words that we use in our breakout. <laughs> Hip and cool. Hip and cool. <laughs> okay. As we answered some of the questions. <laughs> All right. So, um, Matthew, how should we uh, proceed with getting the uh, feedback? What should what should be the first step? Yeah. Uh, so, if anyone wants to share, kind of what was discussed or any key takeaways from the breakout room, uh, we have a decent sized group here to where we can all kind of just. Uh, share together and I like I like your extending the olive branch uh, Matthew that's some good advice yes so yeah. one of the questions uh, you know to kind of put some context there is yeah how do we improve the intergenerational uh, communication and the gap between there yes and, uh, so one of our group members was asking you know how do they uh, break any stigmas that may be had in the workforce from the younger generation with interacting with older. And my suggestion was, uh, you know, as a more experienced professional, it's always nice when you can extend the olive branch to a younger generation to say, hey, what do you want to learn from me? Or kind of basically saying that, hey, I'm here to help versus that I'm here to judge or, you know, I expect you to just know or, you know, it's me versus the world so to speak like just show that you're there uh, to make the other person feel kind of comfortable and being vulnerable if need be of saying hey i don't know or hey i want to know um xyz uh, so yeah that was the the point of extending the olive branch to kind of bridge some generational gaps uh, i think that's phenomenal it's fantastic We also, okay. just not to take up time, <laughs> we also spoke about emojis, <laughs> Charlie. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, Lisa as well was in our group, but. <laughs> I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> as we talk about communication and uh, the use of emojis and uh, the pros and cons, the pros and cons. Yeah, that's a little, who said that they didn't like it? Was that, was that you, Charlie? The old guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, I, listen, I completely, here's the thing, I, the way I see it and, and, and when I, uh, present to students. I always I say um, something that everyone here knows. You know, when you're communicating with someone professionally, emojis do not are not part of the equation. When you're socially interacting, that's different. So there's a time and place for everything, right? Um, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll go next in terms of the group I was in, which is fantastic because I was with the. Uh, for, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing the last name. The Hunnixes. Yes, that's <laughs> yes. correct. Yes. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let let Bill or Anne say because they were phenomenal and I've learned so much about how to stay happily married. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things, um, at least toward the end, um, we were talking about how when you empower someone, like a younger generation within the workplace, um, they, you need to get out of the way. Um, so you can't just empower them and then still sit there and try and direct things. You have to get out of the way. And you know, that kind of feeds into another um, comment that we talked about, which was that, um, you know, it, so many times um, the baby boomers who tend to be more in charge or at higher levels within the organization um, judge millennials by their own standards or by their own work ethic, and they don't recognize the work ethic that the millennials have. Um, and consequently, um, don't give them the opportunities um, to move up, to learn, don't engage them, and then they're even more likely to leave and go on to the next job, which of course is costly to the organization and they lose the opportunity to have those good people stay. So. Yeah, so just jumping in here, I know, um, Glenn and Amy and I were talking and we kind of danced around a number of different topics from nonverbals to resiliency to different places that people were working or traveling. 
And we actually landed on, you know, the idea of, you know, prior to um, COVID, you know, you could receive all the benefits of nonverbal communication. You could see people's faces, you could pick up on body language cues, all of these things. Um, and one of us was sharing about how they had just traveled by plane and how, you know, the stewardess uh, or the flight attendant was needing to stay in the cabin unless they were really called down and how there was almost a loss of community, not only from staying in your place, right? But also when they walked around, the mask would be on and you couldn't see smiles or anything. And so you think about how there's, you know, we like to have connections. We like to, um, we're social beings, right? And so, you know, where we landed was really on what's the, what's the playbook now for being able to um, pick up on those nonverbal cues that are now masked, right? And, and we, didn't get to, we didn't get to anything, but, you know, Matthew, you were talking about emojis. Charlie, sorry, you're not interested in emojis. But, you know, the, my, the thing that came to my mind was I'm like, what are the mask emojis that we might need to, like, slide on and off or change or something to be able to help create that sense of community? Um, well, there's a whole catalog of masks now that, that are quite revealing uh, they range, uh, at least in Florida, from, you know, one's political beliefs to one's hatred in terms of what your face looks like. And some of them are, do you shake your head and go, oh, my Lord, are you kidding me? So, so, but I, I, I'm personally of the opinion, man, I hope we don't start communicating with masks. You know, that's like really bad. That's, to me, yeah, that's worse than emojis. That's, well, we kind of, we, we, sorry, Ann, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, what you're reduced to is eyes. Yeah. So you try to see, Good we have point. to be more intent on, on reading people's eyes because that's all we've got to go on. Yep. And the other thing, you know, I was thinking about, we have to be more intentional about our speech to convey that's how right. we're feeling. That's exactly right. You know, so glad to see you're here or nice to see you or something like that that replaces the smile. That's, that's right. That's right. And I was just to add to what Anne said, and, and, you know, Charlie, completely understanding what you're saying. Um, the only way I see something being a disadvantage is if you don't inform yourself on how to do it in an alternative way, right? So no. the fact that we have, that we're wearing masks or we have to wear masks in certain uh, environments and settings, for me, that's fine because I'll know what I'll need to do in lieu of that, you know, use my hands, say, oh my goodness, it's great to see, you know, the, be more emphatic and be more present um, and, and make it work to my advantage so that, uh, that I emit the emotion that I want to emit, not rely on, you know, a mask. Uh, uh. We also spoke about um, what do you believe you have to share professionally with others, right, Bill? Yeah, I, um, I try to get staff to, you know, to step up, if you will, empower them. I, I changed the job titles and did some tricky stuff just to get them to think differently. But basically, getting people who've been um, disrespected, really, I call them the designated blamees. You know, there's a couple of organizations I've been at where you have people who are, are the, the ones that are blamed for anything. Um, sometimes they, you know, they deserve it. Sometimes they don't. It just, and I, I didn't tell you this, but one time uh, we were talking about a problem in one of my meetings and somebody walked by to get a cup of coffee and I said it was their fault. And uh, they looked and said, what? what? I said, what well, happened to walk by? At the time, we were talking about a problem, so it's your fault. And, I, and the point was, of course, that that's about the level of analysis that we typically do uh, when we have a problem. It's just, uh, you know, blame the first person who happens to walk by. Anyway, so th that was one, trying to get them to learn things like that. And another one was to ask for complaints about yourself. Yeah. Ask for feedback. Um, 
rather than be defensive. And that took a while before they got it, but then they got it. And that changed the whole culture of the whole organization, right to the top, right to the top. Because when the blamees ask for more, it changes everybody. Anyway, so there's a couple things. Thank you. Well, good, good. I'm glad everyone sounded like they had some fruitful conversations that uh, provided some good insight. Uh, I haven't really thought about much about the mass communication aspect, so uh, that was cool to kind of reflect on and uh, makes me think about, uh, you know, you, we're using our eyes and eyebrows and forehead area now to really communicate since we can't, to Anne's point, we can't just smile and give a nice nod because you have a frown, frown now and you're giving a nod to somebody you never know uh so uh, Matthew, yes Matthew, see i wanted to say i think that uh learning how to communicate on zoom mm -hmm. is really more you know very important i'm just beginning to learn how to do that yes and i think uh, with the work you've done and joel and ann in terms of the the forum have been leading the way for me anyway, and showing mm -hmm. about how to get communication to happen. Because so, on some levels, it's really hard because you can't just break in like you can in a face-to-face -face meeting. On the other hand, we have Catlaho. We have people, I don't know, from all over. I, I'm in Wisconsin, you know. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have done that face-to-face. -face. So there's some real advantages and there's some real disadvantages. But I think the breakouts, the polls, um, I think, Michelle, you're moderating the way you're doing it. I think all of these are different skills on Zoom than they are in person. And I think as a society, we're starting to learn that. And so I'm helpful. I'm hopeful that other people might have ideas on how do you do this well? Very much so. And one thing I, uh, I would say is that it's, it's caused people to be more ref slow to speak. Uh, sort of speak, you know, a little bit more reflective when they're in group conversations now because you do have the mute button. So it's a lot harder to just jump in and say what's right on your mind. You have to, you know, wait for the person that's speaking to stop speaking. Uh, you can't use physical cues to say that, hey, I want to speak. Uh, like if we're in a meeting and we're all at a table, you know, I could sit up or something like that to just kind of my body language could indicate that, hey, I'm about to say something or I want to say something. On Zoom, you can't really do that because me sitting up really doesn't mean anything to you all, uh, you know, on your respective uh, screens. So uh, Zoom has definitely, I, I, I feel like, has caused people to think a little bit more before they speak or make sure that they're intentional when they do speak. Uh, just change of dynamics. Can I, can I answer, can I answer that? Um, Go for it. Um, what, I, what I think Zoom has done is uh, to piggyback on what's been said uh, just to add to it is that now that we can communicate with someone regardless of where they are in the world mm -hmm. there is therein that in itself is a commonality and you get to ask folks well how is Merritt island or charlie i love your shirt like wow what's the weather like down there or and your background is that is that a sycamore tree like there's so many things that you can use to your advantage to find a commonality, right? Because that's what communication is all about. And if you're sincere about it, it'll show. Just like if you're not present, it will show, right? So this is what we talk about, and I, and I talk about this quite often on my podcast as well, a little shameless plug there. Um, just on eye gaze, right? Just on eye gaze, looking straight at the camera. Or if I'm looking at my phone and not being engaged, um, I'm not saying anyone here is doing that, but I'm just saying that it, it, it requires us to um, be more resourceful with our um, environment and, to, to, and, and that also um, encourages others to do the same, right? So if I'm smiling, you smile, right? If I say, how are you doing? You know, you respond. So I think actually it's an opportunity to be closer in the best, you know, the best way possible that we can be. Um, Michelle, can I just ask a question about that? Um, sure. I've had my video off because I'm, I'm not doing any of those professional things you had on your screen. At the start. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Put that fully out there. Um, but um, I'm, so I work with students a lot and um, 
I saw the other day, I can't remember which district it was, that they were requiring students, it was about dress code, so they were requiring students to be dressed like they would be for school, and they weren't allowed to shut their cameras off um, during class. And I think about um, youth, particularly, because that's the, the population I work with, but who maybe don't want to share their backgrounds, and um, th like the, and I didn't have my camera off because I'm worried about like, you know, people seeing my background, it's more just <laughs> where I am today. Um, but that idea that it connects us when we can see each other and do eye contact those in those pieces and then um, balancing that with, um, yeah, I guess just that, that privacy piece or maybe people don't want to be on, like they don't want their face to be there. That doesn't mean they're, they're disengaged, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts around that. I don't know that there was a real question there, but no, I, I, I'll respond to that. Um, I will say that um, what I have noticed, I'll give an example. I spoke at a, for, uh, to a college recently and half of the students didn't have their cameras on. And that's challenging from a speaker perspective because if you can't see someone's face, you're like, oh my goodness, what are they thinking? You know, they have mute on, like everyone here is mute. And I appreciate that because you're being considerate, right? But sometimes when you have, when you have sound on, you get to gauge the environment you know is it noisy like what do i need to like there's a lot of things going on there what i say is um if if since you're working with students i think it's making them feel comfortable in projecting what they're projecting and 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 being engaged in the process right so right now you know i see a lot of stuff in everyone's background that reflects them but that's part of them so i don't want to alienate them from that right so for example um, I'll use Lisa and Katie, not to put you on the spot to put on your camera, but to say, hey, Lisa, hey, Katie, thanks for joining. Alan, I love that shirt. You know, reminds me of the one that I got for my friend. You know, Charlie, I love that. You know, you, you point out, as I mentioned before, little cues that make them feel like, oh my gosh, she just noticed me in a good way, in a good way. And so what does it, that draws the person in, <clears throat> you see? It draws the person in. Now you can't control people's behavior, right? People, there's a lot going on in our world. So I'm not gonna disenfranchise someone because they may be distracted. And, 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 but while I'm in this space, I'm gonna lead with incubating sensitivity, right? So with students, it's about, I would say it's about being in, including them and finding a way to do that. Tell me, Amy. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I like that approach, like just pointing out, you know, and then maybe it, um, Joel put in there seen and heard, but like that idea, yes. going back to the flight, right? Like, did the person on that flight want to be seen and heard? Like, did they want that connection with the, the stewardess who, who they couldn't have it? But I'm wondering too, just drawing out those connections with, regardless if it's students or adults, like if that makes other people want to turn their camera and be more engaged because it's like you're making personal connections. I just, it's an int I've never, I haven't done that yet, yet when I've been working with youth and I just, it's an interesting thing to think about. I, I also think it's a great time to exhibit manners. Good morning, Glenn. Good afternoon, Joel. Hey, Matthew, it's great to see you. How's your afternoon going? Good evening. Before I close, I just wanted to wish everyone a lovely evening. I look forward to see you tomorrow. It's a great way, you know, manners, right? Protocol, that's my background, right? So I think it's a great time to reintroduce that to your advantage. <coughs> hey, Amy, tomorrow it's gonna rain. How are you, how do you feel about that? So it's like finding something and being sincere, being sincere. Um, uh, I hope that answers. Um, nice. Well, sorry to kind of jump in here, but we are coming up on the end of the hour and uh, to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, thank you, Michelle, so, so much for coming and sharing your insight. And to everyone else, uh, Michelle will be around at the coffee hour tomorrow, uh, Thursday at 12 to 1. Uh, so feel free to come with any more questions or if anything else kind of hits in your mind overnight and you're just like, oh, I gotta share this or I wanna ask this or what have you, uh, we would be happy to see you all uh, tomorrow. And uh, just as a reminder, we do have another ILC coming up on the 30th with Sandra Long. Uh, and so feel free to join for that one as well. Uh, and Michelle's uh, podcast has been plugged into the chat there. So 
definitely shameless check it out. Plug. Yeah. Shameless plug for the podcast. I'm looking forward to tomorrow, but here's my question. Who's bringing the coffee and the croissants? Do I have to do that? <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't share through virtually yet. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> BYOC. Bring your okay. own coffee. <laughs> All right. Um, can I take a photo of everyone so that when I post it, on, is that okay? And friend everyone on LinkedIn. Is everyone on LinkedIn? It's fine with me, I'm sure. Is that okay with everyone? If anyone has any happy answers, I'm totally fine with it. Is it okay to take a photo? Hey, Ma hey, Matthew, can I add something on the coffee mugs? <laughs> That's okay. I, some of you may know this. I've been doing these podcasts to a colleague of mine, Chuck Samikian, and his podcasts are driven by coffee mugs. And the way he starts oh. out every podcast is he says, okay, hold up your favorite coffee mug, take a sip, and tell us the story behind that coffee mug. Oh, wow. We should, we should start doing that. That's, I think that's a great idea, Charlie. I think that's a we great start idea. Doing that, you know? but, this, but in this case, you promote the Global Advocate Career Podcast, right, Charlie? <laughs> right? Uh, what, no, the, my podcasts are kind of isolated to, to certain industries. So that's, Okay, but you have a background. I remember you had a background in international affairs. I yes, very much so. That. See? Yeah. That's another thing, remembering what someone said, that way you can go back to it and charm them. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks so much. See you guys tomorrow. See thank you, everyone. Michelle. Thanks, man.